All right, everyone, thank you for coming in. I'd like to present Christopher Kent, and he is doing the comparative analysis by state of taxation of utility scale wind projects. Take a look, Chris. Thank you, AJ. Thank you. Hey, right, how's everyone doing today? Good, enjoying the weather? It's awesome outside, isn't it? Great day for being stuck inside talking about taxes. <laughs> so, uh, as AJ introduced, my name is Christopher Kent. Um, I'm doing a project on wind energy and the taxation surrounding it. Uh, it's an in-depth analysis on local taxes uh, for the Rocky Forge Wind Project, a, the first utility scale wind farm being built in Botetourt County, it was right around south of Roanoke about. Um, this is the first utility scale in Virginia. There's no tax precedent set for taxing a facility of this sort, so I went ahead and tried to find some precedent from different states. Uh, so I'll show you a bit of the agenda going on today. Uh, I'll be talking about my methodology, a few states I studied in particular, applying their wind, uh, their state taxes to wind energy for Virginia, and then I'll finish up with a conclusion. So <clears throat> now that we went over the agenda, let's talk about why I did this and what's going on. Uh, let's begin with wind energy itself. It's a burgeoning economy in the United States of America, and if you're an ISAT student, and I apologize if you're already aware of this information, but for everyone else, renewable energy is a market that's growing and ripe for investment. For me, I equate wind energy with uh, wind turbines as a new oil well, the new black gold. Why, you might ask? What do I mean by this, you ask yourself? Well, think about this. In the 19th century, oil was discovered to be a powerful source of not only energy, but capital and money. A poor farmer in the state of Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, or Texas, if they found oil underneath their property, was able to make a profit overnight, to go from boom to bust by leasing their lands to corporations who wanted that oil. Well, the same could be said about wind energy. If you find <coughs> wind energy on your farm, on your property, you have the potential of leasing that property and making a big buck off it. But instead of looking down, you'll be looking up, up into the air. And let's be honest, I think wind turbines look a lot better than a big, black, mucky oil well throwing up oil into the air. Getting onto my methodology, it was pretty straightforward and simple. Uh, it was a process of researching state tax codes, differentiating them from federal law, and actually differentiating state tax codes from local county tax codes. First though, I had to uh, uh, I had to find the states I wanted to study. That's why I chose Texas, Iowa, and North Carolina. Texas and Iowa, plain and simply, are the two largest power, wind power generating states in America. Great resource for tax precedent. Great reason to choose these states. They have, Texas last year generated 500 megawatts of electricity from just wind power alone. So we get to North Carolina. North Carolina is our southern sister state Similar to us, they actually just implemented their first utility scale wind farm uh, right north of Elizabeth City, the Amazon East Wind Farm. Now that's a 208 megawatt project, <coughs> but it's the first utility scale wind farm in the state of North Carolina. In these three states, I had to choose representative wind farms to understand how the local taxes applied and how the state taxes applied to wind farms, which is why I chose the Silver Star, Sand Bluff, wind farms in Texas, the Northern Iowa Wind Power, and Pocahontas Prairie Wind Farm in Iowa, and the Amazon East Wind Farm in North Carolina. The resources I used for this project were the American Wind Energy Association, a great source of qualitative information on wind energy, and what's going on with wind energy, why it's good, why you should invest, why we should be looking into it. Following that, I used the Energy Information Agency, a department of the DOE, a great source of not only qualitative but quantitative data and all on all energy sources in this country on imports and exports of energy and energy creation within specific states. Following that, it goes back to this simple research method of I just had to look up the state tax codes. We went, I went through Iowa tax code, I went through North Carolina tax code, I went through Texas tax code, and I ended up on Virginia tax code. Now I've been talking about my process, but I haven't really talked about Botetourt County. So right up on this screen, you see the picture, a computer-generated photo of what the Rocky Forge wind project will look like from the nearest property. Now, don't those wind farms, wind turbines look nice up there? You know, it's a nice view. And that's from the nearest property, all right? So the Rocky Forge wind project 
is the first utility scale project in the state of Virginia. I've said that multiple times. It's going to generate approximately 75 megawatts of energy, of power, of electricity. 75 megawatts of electricity. That's enough to power 20,000 homes in the United States. And over the course of the entire lifespan of this wind farm, Rocky Forge Wind Power Project should generate 20 to 25 million dollars in tax revenue for the local county and the state. That's a lot of money for, from one wind farm. So let's talk about federal taxes now. We have to start big and then we can get smaller and talk about state taxes. To understand the federal tax system, it is important to understand the history of wind energy deployment in America. So let's start with 1850. The U.S. Wind Energy Company was created. This was a wind energy company that is part of a, quint a quintessential part of agriculture in America. It's not the modern sleek turbines you'd think of nowadays, rather the windmills that powered <coughs> pumps, that created powered pumps for water, irrigation, agriculture uses on farms across America. This company created specific uh, windmills for farms all across the Midwest. But not only a hundred years old, not even a hundred years later, we saw the first power generating wind turbine in America, Grandpa's Knob. It was in Grandpa's Knob, Vermont. It was a 1.25 megawatt wind turbine generating electricity for that little county of Vermont. Following that, in 1979, we saw the University of Massachusetts create the U.S. Wind Power uh, Corporation, which employed a 600 kilowatt wind farm in the state of Massachusetts. In the 1980s, we saw the growth and expansion of the Altamont Pass wind farm in California. California had get, gotten ahead of the game and started building wind turbines quick. By 1986, over 6,000 wind turbines had been built in the Altamont Pass. But let's back up a little bit. Why did California get that many wind turbines by 1986? Well, it's part of the Public Utilities Regulatory Policies Act, or PERPA, in 1978. This was a federal policy act that enabled <coughs> utility corporations uh, and forced them to find alternative sources of energy that generate electricity, what we would now call renewable energies. This 1978 uh, policy encouraged the search for those. In 1992, we saw the Energy Policy Act, of aptly named Energy Policy Act of 1992. This was a huge uh, stepping stone for renewable energy in America because this is this set up the um, <clears throat> pardon me this set up the electric production tax credit uh, something that has been so forceful in generating a uh, wind energy economy that there's actually a direct correlation between the two and I'll show you that later but we saw re and we saw a recent extension of that in 2010 and most recently in 2016. So these federal taxes, I talked about PERPA, this is a 1978 <coughs> regulatory act that created an enforceable way for utilities to start investing in renewable energy. Following that, two smaller programs were the Renewable Energy Production Incentive Program, and a part of that was the Buy America Program. These programs encouraged renewable energy technology companies within the United States, offering them incentives from the federal government to create renewable energies. But a major consideration of this, being the Buy America program, was that these technology companies were selling to foreign countries. It was a plan to beef up, to lower the trade deficit America had with foreign nations. And Buy America was uh, the process of buying American technologies and selling them to foreign nations for, as they build their own renewable energies. <coughs> the MACRS program, or the, <coughs> sorry, the Modified Accelerated Cost Recovery System, is a tax depreciation method that the federal government set up that aids companies in assessing their property and recovering the costs on this property through a specific lifespan. Wind energy in the Mackers bill is placed on a five-year class life. This means over the amount of five years, the, wind pro the property's value would depreciate with the special accounting measures set forth by Mackers. Properties eligible for the Mackers program also become eligible for the Investment Tax Credit, or ITC. The ITC is, a, um, is another electric production tax credit. Um, it was another major part of the 1992 Energy Policy Act, and, is, uh, <clears throat> and it places um, a 30% uh, 
property incentive, it places a production tax credit 30% worth of the property value for the wind farm that's in, or the renewable energy farm that's happening. Following that and continuing this almost FDR style alphabet soup is the PTC. As I said, this is the pro electric production tax credit, which offers a credit per kilowatt hour generated of um, electricity for the course of a taxable year for a specific renewable energy. So this is, as I said, has a great impact on uh, wind energy. This is a graph taken from the Department of Energy. You, as you can see, since the creation of the PS PTC and every year it's expired and or renewed, we've seen an in a decrease or an increase, respectively, in the wind energy economy. So every time this credit that was given to wind energy farms that allowed them to put money back into the taxes to lower the taxes, every time this has been renewed, we've seen an up an increase in the wind energy economy. Now we get to Texas. The large, as I said, one of the largest states of wind power generation capacity in the country. There's a bunch of, uh, Texas um, exempts state utilities from taxes. That's how they go about the process of encouraging utility companies in the state. They exempt them from sales, use, uh, use and excise taxes, which is the main process of taxation in Texas. But what they don't, what Texas has is instead of a state property tax, they have county-based property taxes. So <clears throat> these county-based property taxes still apply to wind turbines and wind farms in the state. Um, along with these county property taxes is the gross receipts tax, which is an annual income-based, capital-based tax on the utility, on the energy facility. Now getting back to these uh, county-based property taxes, Texas has two major um, incentives for wind energy corporations and renewable energy corporations. It's section 312 and section 313 of the Texas tax code. These are a property tax abatement and a special assessment valuation respectively. Section 312 allows uh, a tax abatement on a specific facility's property for a max of 10 years. So over the course of 10 years, the, there's an abatement on the tax properties, which means just a lowering and a special valuation of that. 313 actually takes a special valuation of that property, of that facility, and lowers the property tax. Values it at lower cost to the energy facility, at again, at a max of 10 years. As we can see, I have the Silver Star Wind Farm up here and the Sand Bluff Wind Farm. These are two wind farms in the state of Texas, similar in generating capacity to the Rocky Forge Wind Project. The estimated tax return for, uh, most recently for the Silver Star Farm was $44,000. The estimated property value of this was over $9 million. Now, I wasn't able to find the tax return for the Sam Bluff wind farm, but what I did find is that its estimated property value was over $24 million. So if we can look and say and extrapolate a bit that we got $44,000 from a $9 million facility, Think about what we could do with a $24 million facility. This is just the Silver Star Wind Farm breakdown of where it paid taxes and the tax rates it paid. Um, as we can see, the estimated tax is a conglomeration of taxes paid to Erath County, the county it's based in, Middle, Middle Trinity Water, a water-based utility in that area, along with Erath Ward Road and Bridge, another special section of that county. Each of these total estimates add up to that $44,000 of tax revenue. One quick question. Can you go back, Chris? Does that, does that imply that they're paying taxes to three different jurisdictions? Yes. Okay. Within, within Erath County, they pay taxes to these three jurisdictions. Okay. While Texas has exemptions from taxes for utilities, Iowa takes a different approach. Iowa is an incentive based off of credits. Iowa state utilities, wind farms, wind facilities have to pay sales, have to pay use, and have to pay excise taxes that Texas utilities wouldn't have to pay. So in lieu of that, we have a business property credit, a renewable energy credit, a wind energy production credit, and again, a special property valuation. These credits basically generate um, revenue for the facility that then go pay off directly the taxes that is owed by the wind energy facility. Again, we see the Northern Iowa Wind Power Farm, 
and the Pocahontas Prairie Wind Farm. These two, you can see the generated net taxes and the net value. And if we go over to the Iowa Wind Power, starting in the far column in 2013, going over to 6, 2016, we can see a net increase on the taxes due each year to the state, even though you can notice the business property credit has increased each one of those years. So not only are these facilities still receiving credits, still receiving more credits than the previous year, the net taxes have gone up, thus indicating a larger amount of revenue sent into the local county and state. Same with the Pocahontas Prairie. In 2013, it was, it was a zero. But in 2016, the business property tax credit was $2,000, and its net taxes were $9,000. Sorry, guys. Got a trigger for uh, North Carolina, as I said, has built its first utility-scale wind farm. It's the Amazon East Wind Farm, 2008-megawatt project. Now, North Carolina is similar to the state of Virginia, and a major reason I chose this was because of its political demographics. But they're not that warm to renewable energies as we in Virginia are really kind of creeping up in that game. In 2017, the North Carolina Congress at, um, issued a moratorium on all future wind projects within the state, prohibiting future projects from being built. Uh, their citing and their reasoning was uh, military bases and infringement on radar. Now this could be seen as due diligence, but it also should be noted that all wind projects have to be cleared by the FAA and by re near military installations in case of impedance to the radar systems. So it could be due diligence that the North Carolina Congress passed this, but it also could just be a way to block wind energy from being produced in the state. But let's get back to the taxes he paid. So there's a privilege tax for corporations in North Carolina. This is a base tax all corporations pay within the state. It's a rate of 4.75%. But if you're an electric utility, you get a special tax. It gets lowered to 3.22%. This is a base tax and the major tax all electric utilities pay. And now that the Amazon East Wind Farm was just built in 2017, they, were, they were, didn't have a tax return available for this year. But according to Amazon's estimates, over $500,000 will be generated in revenue for the local counties and state and over $600,000 a year will be rev uh, generated just for the local property owners, all right? That's a lot of money. Now we've come back to Virginia. Virginia has a special income tax for, ba for all corporations. It's a basic tax of 6% annually. In the state of Virginia though, they have a <clears throat> adjustments for electric utilities, which is just a basic, uh, a special way for an accountant to go through and lower the costs electric utilities have to pay. Along with that, electricity pays a gross receipts tax as seen in uh, Texas and North Carolina of 1.45% annually. So these are the base taxes for electric utilities in the state. In Botetourt County, there's a licensing tax of gross receipts of one half of a percent. That figure is wrong on the screen, it should be 0.05%. I apologize for that. But that's an annual fee to operate in this region of Botetourt County. Along with that, there's a property real estate tax of 79 cents per $100 of, for uh, property within the county of Botetourt. Now, as I said this whole time, there wasn't a precedent set for wind energy in the state of Virginia. Well, that was a bit of a strength, um, a bit of a lie. There is one section of tax code that's applicable to wind energy facilities in the state of Virginia. And that language actually increases property tax rates for wind energy facilities. The language of that is on the screen. But basically what it says is that the real estate rate for taxes due to a county, which is usually the lowest rate of a, a county can base, is not, uh, are not paid by wind facility. A county can actually ask the facility to pay higher property taxes um, up to, I think in Botetourt County, the highest rate it can pay is $2 per $100 worth of property. So that's actually a clause in an electric utility tax rate um, section of the tax code, where for every other type of utility and energy facility, tax rates are lowered, but for wind energy facilities, they're raised. So let's talk comparison. What, are, what can we learn from these three states I studied and what can we apply to Virginia? So the basic thing is, North Carolina has special taxes for utilities. Texas has incentives through exemption of taxes for utilities. Iowa has incentives through credits for utilities. 
all three of these measures could actually be applicable to Virginia. It's just a matter of whether Virginia would want to have utilities earn credits to then pay off the taxes or exempt these utilities from paying the taxes in the first place. So in concluding thoughts, after all my research, um, the process, I really just researched tax incentives through legislation uh, that were utilized by these utilities in the different states. That's what the research showed, is that each state has incentives in their own process, in their own way, for electric utilities, and they grow, possibly, the wind energy economy. For the state of Virginia, though, in, in particular, I implore that it ought to be considered that Virginia remove the amendment that increases property taxes for wind energy, which is found under section 58.1-2606, subsection C, which allows, which enforces that counties can let wind facilities pay higher taxes than any other energy facility in the state. Uh, for future research, I'd really like to go back and interview legislative members on the motivations behind the legislation they passed for these incentives in each of these states. Why did Iowa go ahead with credits? Why did Texas go ahead with exemptions? It'd be great to go back and look at the specific actors and why they did this and ask them how they did this. Along with that, I think it'd be great to get property owners' testimonials to see how they feel with a wind farm on their property. Did they receive a good amount of revenue? Did they like it? I think those are important questions to ask these people. That wraps up my uh, research today. I just have a short bibliography here. I just want to give a thank you for everyone for showing up, to Dr. Miles for all his help on the project. I got one more thing. I would love to get a selfie with everyone in here. <laughs> so we could just get a quick photo. That'd be awesome. If I could get my camera to work. All right. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Smile, everyone. All right, we got one half, the other half. All right, thank you guys. Thank you for your time. Do we have time for questions, AJ? Okay. Any questions? Is there anything special um, that the once a useful life the turbines run up, I guess, with the uh, deconstructing them? Is there anything interesting in taxes that comes up? For like, so after the lifespan occurs? I guess so, yeah. Well, what these tax incentives had increased was actually, in a way, lowered maintenance and operation costs. Because if you're lowering the taxes, you can, lower you can just lower all the costs you have in general. So no, I didn't find actually any specific tax referencing deconstruction or construction of the facility itself. Uh, turbine still, um, contractors still had to pay a sales tax on the turbine, on the generator, the same way you'd buy a piece of t uh, a t-shirt or something from a store and get a sales tax on that. Mm -hmm. um, but there wasn't, from my knowledge, a special tax for deconstruction. I think for many facilities that's so long in the future that the legislation hasn't looked there yet. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks. All right. Well, thanks. All right. Well, you don't think you're getting off the stage before I ask a question? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be getting off easy. <laughs> um, so I just want to clarify one thing. Did I hear you say that a jurisdiction in Virginia has the legal opportunity to charge a, at a higher tax rate for a wind farm than they would otherwise uh, for a, just conventional property yes. taxes? Or no, for any, for specifically if you were a natural gas plant or uh -huh. a coal plant, yep. you could have a lower property tax than a wind energy facility. So a wind energy facility gives a county flexibility in its tax rate, whereas for another energy source it, it would be a fixed rate? Yes, that, that's a good way of putting it. It would be a fixed rate and at the lowest rate possible for that facility, whereas the, energy, whereas the wind turbine, wind facility has a bit of leeway there. And did you determine why the legislation was that way? It, that was, it was, it, that's the way it just was. There wasn't much reasoning. I, I wasn't able to find the actors, the specific legislative members that put the bill forward, but that's part of the future research I want to take advantage of. And it was no, there was no language that, that treated solar similarly? No, it's specifically wind energy. Solar was not treated. In, in, in that passage of that uh, section of the tax code, it was specifically referencing energy utilities Interesting. and then wind energy in itself. Okay. So if you were to look at that, the, uh, where it says the real estate rate, that's at 79 cents per $100. 
But then it says the personal property tax rate, which in Botetourt County is at two dollars and seventy one per okay. acre hundred. And you you also have been referencing what you would do next. Are you actually going to do any more work in this area? I think it'd be an interesting area to pursue. I've always uh, been intrigued by policy and uh, growing up in the DC area with parents who are journalists, I've always been thrust into politics from an early age. So I think it would be interesting to get into policy of this, to do an analysis of how we can encourage more policy that's um, profitable for the wind uh, energy economy and for renewable energies in general. I think that's a huge economy that we can take advantage of from the basis of that it gives property tax, it gives local counties and states more revenue, and on the factor that it's a great way to become energy independent, if we're worried about that. Mm -hmm. um, but as of right now, I have no future in that. I actually leave in July for the Peace Corps, where I'll be serving two years teaching English in the Caribbean. Oh, which so, country? Uh, St. Lucia. Very nice. Yes, very nice. Thank you. All right. So, yeah. All right. Good work, Chris. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.